Okay, so we continue. So seeing smoke, uh, you, the reference becomes fire, okay, the semantic object. So when you see smoke, you immediately suggest, well, fire. However, um, the interpretant or the situated uh, effect becomes look, danger or arson or something else. For some people, it may even be escape, smoke. Let's get out of here. There's a smoke screen. For the next one, uh, there's a smell. You're walking uh, through a place, a shopping mall or something, and there's a smell, a nice smell. And the semiotic object would be food because, you know, you smell a burger or fish or something nice, and the semiotic object would be food. However, the interpretant could be either hunger, or I'm really hungry, or nausea. You know, I've eaten too much. Uh, my stomach's full. I don't, can't eat anymore. I've got to get away from this smell. So the third diagram, you're on a plane, you're on an aeroplane, and there's wind turbulence. So the plane starts going up and down, and you know, I, I really dislike wind turbulence when I'm on aeroplanes, and I always try and get a, a safe uh, company, uh, airline company that will get me there safely in a, a big plane to reduce the, the effect of wind turbulence. And especially when you're trying to work or you're trying to sleep or when you're flying over the Pacific Ocean in the middle of the night and you're right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and there's a very significant turbulence, then it gets a little scary, right? Or a little bothersome, bothersome. But that's okay. It gets a little bothersome. So there's wind turbulence in the plane and the referent is crashing, possibly, possibly. Okay, and I know that's, that's quite a conventional thought for people. The effect, the interpretant is, can be uh, palpitations, heart palpitations, or toilet urgency. You've got to go to the toilet quickly. And, you know, a lot of people feel safe in the aeroplane toilet. So a lot of people um, decide to either strap on their seatbelt or go to the toilet at times when the wind turbulence is quite significant. Okay, let us now uh, quickly begin to speak about three terms that Peirce uh, introduced to us. And these were kind of around prior to Peirce, but not really. And Peirce um, definitely made them prominent ideas. The ideas of iconicity, symbolism, and indexicality. And, you know, right now we're um, uh, speaking about the signs, so we're definitely not going to extend on these now, although an enormous amount of work has been done on these. The icon is the relation of the object to another of similarity. Okay, so the icon, these are three kinds of signs. So the icon is, um, the icon is uh, an object which uh, relates to something else by similarity. Okay, so if you have um, a picture of someone, your friend, then that becomes an icon because it's quite a strong representation of uh, what it's trying to represent. Okay, it's a picture of your friend and you, anybody who looks at it will immediately know it's John or Renato or somebody. A map. A map is a strong, very strong, very, uh, well, we'd hope so. It's a strong, uh, very accurate representation of something, a diagram. And they're the obvious ones. The less obvious ones are algebraic expressions or metaphors. The symbol. The symbol has no natural link, no resemblance or similarity between the representation and the semiotic object. Okay but it's a socially conventional interrelation with the semiotic object, the symbol. So if I put up my thumb, if I put up my thumb and my fist and I say, okay, people will get that as positive, a positive connotation, okay? Connotationally, it is positive. And people will say, okay, this guy likes what I do. However, it could be sarcastic and, you know, but anyway, this guy likes what I do and the socially conventional interrelation with the semiotic object suggests that it's a positive thing. The index, however, is a factual connection to its object. It's factual. 
and the index is um, something that we're going to speak about uh, uh, extensively later on. But the index is basically a suggestion or a pointing to that's somewhat physical. Physical. And I, I use that term again, physical, uh, instead of natural. Natural. I don't like the word natural. I uh, don't really know um, what it means because the etymology is definitely not there um, as it is in physical. So an index can have many levels uh, as can an icon and a symbol. But an index, uh, when we look at um, current work in indexicality, we'll understand. The index and the icon, we see that whether a sign belongs in one category or another is dependent on the relationship between the sign itself and the referent, the actual meaning. So the index and the icon are really predicated on whether the sign is, belongs to the icon or index categories is really predicated on the relationship between uh, the sign and the reference. Okay, so the reference plays a very important part. And the way in which we see things, the way in which we see things um, determines, um, de determines whether the uh, sign is an icon or an index. So looking at reference and meaning, uh, reference and meaning can, the combination of these can um, become an icon, an index, or a symbol. Okay, now it's important to remember to know that uh, these, uh, these three types of sign are never absolute. You know, uh, a sign can have um, iconicity, it can have indexicality and symbolism, you can have a little of the, each of the three. You can have a lot of one and less of the other and less of the other. Or you can switch. It can switch depending on, predicated on, the contingent on the um, situation. The factors that determine this include uh, the quality of feeling, uh, the reaction resistance, or the representation or mediation mediation. Okay, if it's mediated in different ways, then it changes. Okay, so mediation plays a very important part. So to determine the quality of feeling, Peirce told us that there's a three-way division, a trichotomy, via three phenomenological categories, which we will not enter into now, but later on possibly, definitely. And in terms of representation and mediation, there is a dependency on how the sign stands for its denoted object. And when we look at denotation and connotation and everything else, uh, we will discuss that. But there is a dependency on the ways in which the sign stands for its object. And that informs our, our understanding of its representation and also the mediation. You know. So we're having a, uh, a first look at this and later on we will revisit all of this and we'll flesh out and investigate everything at a much deeper level. Okay, so let's now look at this um, table. And at the top we have the sign types, the icon, the index, the symbol. And right underneath that we see uh, a description of its semantic mode. And we see that the icon interrelates with its semantic object through resemblance similarity. Okay. So there's a resemblance, a similarity. So we know it's an icon because it resembles. It's similar. A map or a picture or something, a uh, mathematical formula. OK, the index, however, interrelates with a semantic object through actual, physical, imagined, causal connections or natural relation. OK, so for example, we see um, uh, smoke. And the index there is that there is fire. Okay. Uh, the symbol interrelates with the semantic object through convention, conventional. And there is no physical link. You know, the thumb up doesn't uh, mean that it's great, but we know because it's symbolic. So, for example, the icon uh, is a photograph, a painting, a diagram, musical notes, smells. The index, the index, the index, an example of the index would be smoke, a disease symptom, a falling log crash. So you hear a boom, 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 you know it's a falling log. A symbol could be a stoplight, some sort of insignia, Morse code, 
uh, a logical sign or an algebraic sign. We make sense of the icon through sensation. The index, how do we make sense of the index? We make sense of the index through perception, inference, action, reaction. And we make sense of the symbol through learning by instruction and by doing. Okay? By learning, because it is socially conventional. The icon has a quality of its own. The index, however, is factual. And the, there is a factual connection to its object. The symbol becomes a habit or conventional rule connected to the interpretant. Both the icon and the symbol presuppose social cultural frameworks so that they can become applicable to language. Now at the bottom, right at the bottom, the um, final qualities that I want to mention about these three types of signs is that the symbol uh, pigeonholes signs. Okay, it pigeonholes signs because it's conventional, so it pigeonholes signs. Um, the index, however, links signs in physical processes or natural processes. The icon brings two compatible signs into one sign. And we're going to speak about how that does that when we look at iconicity. Okay, so we move on. Peirce grounded a lot of his work on um, the idea of uh, firstness, secondness, and thirdness, uh, which we will elaborate on later, um, uh, later when we look at the complexity of Peirce's work. But uh, the firstness, secondness, and thirdness constitute Peirce's fundamental triad of relations, and the categories by means of which semiosis is qualified and organized. So these ideas of firstness, secondness, and thirdness of again, a trinity, which Peirce extends on, and bases structures all his work on. Okay. Since the sign processing from feeling to conceptualization is a process, is a process, science can have no determinable and self-ordained closure, says Peirce. And this is commensurate with the Heisenberg principle. Now, if you know about Heisenberg's uncertainty, work on uncertainty, uh, he tells us that, look, uh, we do not know where subatomic particles are. We cannot know. Once we do know, then they're not there anymore. Okay. And the categories are possibilities and potentialities more than actuality essences. Okay. They're p possibilities and potentialities. This is what Heisenberg was telling us, and this is what Peirce is also stressing. Okay. So let's quickly look at firstness. Uh, firstness is, according to, to Peirce, a quality. It's a possibility, a might be, a might be. It inheres, inheres, inherent. It's inherent in the sign. It's what there is, such as it is, without reference nor relation to anything. It's very phenomenological. Yeah? Secondness, on the other hand, is an effect according to Peirce. It's actuality, actuality, well, social, con socially conventional actuality. What happens to be something currently? It's emergent. Okay, of course, it emerges from the object. It is what there is such as it is, in relation to something else, but without relation to a third entity. Thirdness, however, says Peirce, is the product. The potentiality, the probability, the necessity, what would, could, should be, given a certain set of conditions. Thirdness constitutes the potentialities for becoming signs. It's what exists as it is, capable of bringing the second entity into relation with the first. So once again, a uh, different way of representing the Persian uh, triad. So we see our... Um, three objects, our three types of signs, the icon, the index, and the symbol, and we see that each one can become something else depending on dependency. Okay, dependency, mediation, uh, situated context, and everything else. The associative and semiotic matrix. A sign can be in varying degrees iconic, indexical, and symbolic, all at the same time or not. A sign's convincing one sign type does not preclude its manifesting some other sign type as well. 
There are no all or nothing categories with respect to signs. As one sign type is, another sign type can become. And what that sign was may become of the nature of the first sign that the second sign is now. So we're looking at a very, very fluid, a very rheotic system of things. Okay, so now let's quickly do a summary of what we've spoken about with uh, reference to signs and uh, the work we've looked at so far. We should note that cultures form through language and language also forms through culture. So, you know, there's a symbiotic relationship there and the two work together to um, give us some sort of cultural linguistic progress to inform cultural and linguistic progress. And when we speak about uh, culture, we, you know, it's, culture is a, is a very public thing, it's a social thing, it's a communal thing. It's not private nor personal, however, we have to be very careful when we speak about uh, the fact that personal efforts, private efforts are not cultural, because that's dangerous thinking and we, you know, we should proceed with caution and trepidation there. Okay, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of the work now um, that we look at in semiotics and semiology combines the work of Saussure and Peirce. And of course, there are other people who have done other work, uh, whose work we will um, look at very soon. But these people uh, have also tried to combine Saussure and Peirce, and some of these people have, and um, including Ben Van Nist, and uh, quite successfully in many ways, and we'll look at that in due course. Um, signs and sign systems never copy reality. This is what we've spoken about, and that there's a representation. Okay, there is no uh, presentation of reality, and we spoke about that, that's platonic, and the fact that um, everything that we look at is a representation of reality. It can never be reality, okay? The order of things external to language, things external to language and their order and our mediated way, mediated, I'm sorry, way of knowing becomes a representation, just a representation. This alters the socially interpreted and valued representation of things, okay? So there's an alteration. There's always an alteration, and the alteration is very fluid and constantly, continuously changing. Continuously changing. Semiotics is a study of society producing meanings. Society producing meanings conventionally, individually, in situated ways, and producing values in communication. Okay, and the last thing that we uh, should mention to recalibrate ourselves is that mediations are symbolic vehicles that represent things, meanings, and values where mediating vehicles are signs. Okay, the mediating vehicle, the vehicle that mediates our interpretation and the actual object is the sign. Okay, the sign mediates. And there's mediation at many different levels, possibly an infinite number of levels. Okay, so now let's quickly recapitulate. Meaning is generated through chains of signs, chains of signs. And we spoke about the continuous propagation of meaning through uh, uh, a continuous propagation of signs. Okay, sign after sign after sign. Paralleling Bakhtin's model of dialogism. Now, uh, Bakhtin is Bakhtin, and we will speak about Bakhtin extensively later on. There's a lot to say there. And Bakhtin is, of course, um, has done great work, uh, had done great work. Bakhtin is now no longer with us. Um, and he had a model of dialogism, which we will um, discuss, uh, where every cultural expression always responds to a prior expression. Okay. Bakhtin also spoke about something else, which is very interesting, uh, um, discourses that present themselves and do not, and present themselves and do not. There's an alternation between uh, discourse appearing and not, which is very interesting. Peirce employed different terms to describe sign function. So, yes, he did. And you know, there's a lot of confusion uh, in the Peircean terms and the Saussurean terms and other people's terms. And don't worry about the confusion. What's important is that you get a grasp on what each of these three Peircean terms do in his basic triad. Okay, there's a representamen, which is the 
thing, the object that represents itself. There's the socially conventional uh, interpretation and the situated interpretation. Okay, so Post employed many terms, and these are a conceptual process, continuously unfolding, unending, and propagational. He termed the continuously unfolding process, the unending process, unlimited semiosis, where the chain of meaning making by new signs uh, interpreting a prior sign or set of signs just continues and goes on and on and on and on and on. Okay. A code, what is a code? A code is a rule combining sensory impressions with the mental content. So we connect the two, the mental content and the sensory impressions. And the basic signifiers in language, putting them all into a system of meanings, funneling everything into a system of meanings. This allows, the code allows science to work as a whole unit of social meaning. So if we have a code, then these signs all uh, work together as a whole unit of social meaning, and we get our structure. Structure. Sign systems are often described as organized into sets of differences and hierarchies that structure meanings and social values. The form that these differences take is governed by none other than ideology. Okay, so ideology is the governing, the governing governing um, uh, structure, the governing agent uh, that produces form. Okay. okay, for example, if we have a large set of socially constructed meanings for things uh, considered masculine and feminine, um, which are very pervasive of our societies, masculinity and femininity, we see that masculinity and femininity are meaningless, meaningless. And apart from their mutual definition uh, in their encoded, socially encoded binary structure, we see that they're meaningless. And when we look at deconstruction, of course, we'll see that uh, masculinity and femininity are quite flawed, flawed in some ways. You know, uh, we look at Judith, work by Judith Butler and work, work by um, Foucault, and we see that, uh, and Derrida, of course, and we see that the um, ideas of masculinity and femininity are not as they first appear, and they can be well contested. In fact, they are well contested, and um, you know, the ideas that masculinity and femininity uh, relate to the man and the woman, respectively, are very flawed. And you know, uh, we speak about feminism as being um, uh, uh, a study of the uh, um, defending of the rights of women is quite wrong, in fact. Uh, femininity is not and should not be about the rights of women. Uh, by stating that femininity is about the rights of women, that is um, contradicting the real purpose of femininity. Femininity is about assigning agency, um, egalitarian agency, to the marginalized, the oppressed. This is um, femininity, feminism, feminism, feminism. Okay. So when we ultimately look at um, binaries and we begin to look at the construction of signs and everything, we'll understand that the majority of our complex uh, social uses of signs reveals that there's a network of relationships, a network of relationships, not binaries. And you know, binaries are very structuralist and everything, but we will move away from that in due course and understand that our, our complex social use of signs is, presents an infinite network and um, a very deconstructionist viewing of these things. So signification thus becomes a process, product, and social event where all society interprets, decodes, and occurs in encoding and decoding processes. Okay, so there's always an encoding, decoding, encoding, decoding process. And you know, that's uh, um, something that uh, these uh, and, you know, Saussure, of course, spoke about that, that there's encoding, decoding, encoding, decoding uh, in every one of us, and that's what goes on continuously. 
the position of the interpreter or the receiver, ourselves as receivers and interpreters of communication, is inscribed in the system. So we're in the system, and our position is in the system. We get into the system. The system is already there. It's delocalized. It's delocalized, as the uh, chemist would say about uh, metallic surface and the electrons. The system is delocalized. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to everybody. We're just in the system. Our ability to decode and understand signification is based on our competence with the sign system and larger cultural encyclopedic uh, awareness or knowledge, uh, understanding, ability, competence of the codes and correspondences. Okay, let's now look at the final part of this talk and move into the idea of semiotic equilibrium, which uh, is uh, quite linguistic anthropological and which pushes us to the um, um, to in the direction of what we want to be doing, which is um, moving towards a better understanding of linguistic anthropology. Now, we spoke about this in relation to Saussure uh, last week, and we will extend on this now. And this is where it really becomes um, an anthropology of linguistics. We remember our sphere, our diagram of the sphere, our ball, 3D ball, and we had our three, uh, two axes with Saussure. It was our y-axis and our x-axis. The y-axis was the axis of semantic values. Our x-axis, however, was our axis of phonological values. Now I am including uh, a new axis, a z-axis. The contextual values. The z-axis is the axis of context. Okay. So remember, we spoke about equilibrium. And equilibrium is when you have negatively placed uh, associations and positively placed associations. So actually negatively placed associations is disassociation. You're saying, look, this flower, this rose is, um, is not a lily, it's not a daffodil, it's not a sunflower, it's not a violet, it's not a daisy. But it is a flower, positively, it is red or white or yellow. It has 30 petals, it is thorny, and it has a nice smell. Okay. So why do I say 30 petals? Because in some languages, in some languages, and including Greek, the rose is uh, called a triandafilo, triandafilo, which means trianda, 30, philo, 30 petals, or 30 leaves. Okay. So that's the name of the rose in Greek, suggesting that it has 30 petals. Now, I don't know if every rose has 30 petals, and you know, maybe some have 29, maybe some have 22 or 40, but you know, that's the name. That's the semantic equilibrium. There's a push and pull along a focus of points, positioning it in some changeable way. There's the phonological equilibrium, where the, which is the x-axis, where there's phonological equilibrium. You know, a rose is not a nose, it's not a bose, it's not a hose, it's not a pose, it's not a road, rome, or rays. It's a rose. However, there are uh, dialectical, uh, sociolectical variations. Okay. And you know, if you have a cold or the way you say it or something. Okay. If you're tired, you say it in a different way. And now we introduce a new axis, a z-axis, which is contextual equilibrium. So there's equilibrium uh, depending on uh, uh, its context, the context in which we use the rose. So the positive aspect there. Positively, we say it can be used as a funeral item, as a shirt item, you pin it into your shirt so you look better, uh, a Valentine's Day item, or an item for aroma, an ornamental item, a culinary item. Some people eat roses, yes they do, for cosmetic purposes, you know. Or uh, it's non-contextualization, you say it's not there for war, it's not there to present music, okay, or something, within a system, of course. So. Um, we uh, look at the flower, and the flower is um, a cluster in itself. Okay. okay, so it becomes a 3D semiotic equilibrium. And once again, we look at this diagram, yet we have an extra axis, the z-axis. So remember, we spoke about the fact that the semiotic coordinates of the rows are not a point, but a continuously shifting um, locus of 3D points now, because we have three axes, and it becomes a bubble within the sphere, within the larger sphere 
of the associational matrix or the semantic matrix, okay, which could be a, a, the system, which could be the language or so. So we have our semantic equilibrium, our y-axis, our phonological equilibrium, our x-axis, and our contextual equilibrium, our z-axis, and the point, uh, the rows, uh, locus set of locus of points, which are the rows, uh, fit into a bubble, a never-changing lava lamp kind of bubble. Okay. So finally, I'm going to speak about the flower and quickly tell you about the flower and what a flower is. And the flower is a cluster. It's a cluster of semantic, semiotic points. Okay. The flower means something. And what does it mean? Well, it's a big cluster of points. Okay. But that's just one cluster. And it's an associational matrix that we think of when we think of the word flower. In the arrangement of that sign in language, in a certain language that we speak. But, you know, there are also other types of um, um, clusters that move along. And this is where the love lamp bub bubble uh, takes form, because it's a bubble that keeps on changing shape depending on the cluster, the associational matrix that we pursue. And it could be uh, a plant, a bud, a rose, um, and, which are all continu contiguous in synonymity. But it can also be um, a nice smelling thing. It could also be a colorful thing. It could also be something that we use in other ways, employed in other ways. Uh, the flower, though, is opposite of other things. The fruit, a vegetable, it's not a fruit. It's not a vegetable, you know. Uh, although some people do consume roses or flowers, but it's not a vegetable. It's a flower, yeah. The flower is clustered associationally. There are associations which form the cluster in language and thus in ways that make it available to be chosen appropriately, contextually, for a certain semantic context that we try to develop when we speak. Okay, so when we speak, we quickly put everything together, we, we situate ourselves in that equilibrium, and we um, uh, appropriate its usage. Okay, so that's how signs operate in language. So it really depends on the pathway that is chosen in the associational matrix in our system that we call language. OK, so let's continue next week when we speak about our next person, Roland Barthes.